was going to do this for four hours and it was going to this end. I did a class once like that. <laughs> okay, so tell us about your coins. Yes. Yes. Very good. Very good. So your coins are they? Remind me. Can I can I see them? It, do they have? Can you read them really well, or do they have on the little uh, uh, thing what they are? Is, is there a description? Oh, okay, okay. Well, this is fabulous. So these, I'm gonna just this. This. Um, so if you're watching, um, Liam has Roman coins. Um, one from the Emperor Aurelian, and one from Constantius II. Um, one of the sons of Constantine the Great. Um, and this is the time period that we're talking about today. So this is very cool. Um, did everybody get to see Liam's coins when he brought them in before? Or does anyone want to, do you want to check them out? You, um, since he was good enough to bring them in again. So this is the exact time period we are talking about today. And I had to read a couple of chapters and there was a lot of information. So we're gonna talk about what's going wrong in the empire, we're going to talk about why it went right for so long, the things they did that were tremendous. And I have some other books that, and pictures that I want to show you, because sometimes it's just easier to show you a map or a picture than to describe it, and it has more impact that way. Um, so let's dive in to the first chapter, page 400. And the first question I asked you, and let me preface it with this. You guys have to remember something. How old is the United States, roughly? You don't have to do exact math, but yeah, a little over 200 years. I was in fourth grade when we had our bicentennial, so, you know, 250 years almost. The Roman Empire, 753 BC, and now we're talking about almost 300 AD. So this is quick math. 700 BC to 300 AD. That's an easy one. 700 before, 300 after. A thousand years. We are talking about a city, a government. Of course, the government changed, right? They had kings. Then they had a republic. And now they have an empire. A thousand years. So would you be disturbed if the United States started falling apart and you could see it was on the way out? We would, we would all be very disturbed. But the United States is a drop in the bucket compared a, a quarter of the time that Rome has already been in existence. So can you see how people might be a little freaked out Things are going really, really poorly in the empire. But it's Rome, for crying out loud. It's been here forever, for generations and generations, centuries. Rome has been in charge. And so the question is, what happened to make it fall apart? But also another question is, how did it last so long? I mean, the United States, I don't think, is on the edge of falling apart. But we have problems. Right? We have problems. In other words, Rome had problems sometimes. But uh, so the first question I asked you <clears throat> is what three tools used by Rome to conquer and govern the world are described in chapter 22? What are their three main tools? Army, law, and buildings. Did you? I think there might have been more than three or nuances. Did you? Is that the same thing you put? Okay. Let's talk about those one by one, okay? Let's talk about the army. I asked you to describe an army. Did anybody, did you draw a little illustration or how is the army divided? Do you want to take this one, Elliot? Sure, yeah. So, uh, there's legions. Mm hmm. And then there's the English legion. There's 
cohorts. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so if a legion is about 6,000 and it's divided into 10, how many are in each cohort? 600. Do you remember Marcus was a cohort commander, right? And when the, um, oh, Placidus, the guy who was traveling with the, the, the big wig, um, and he was kind of snarky towards Marcus, and he'd been snarky towards Eska on the wolf hunt. He, oh, you, you were a cohort commander? You're way above centurion level, six times as many guys. And, and then they had another um, subgroup called the auxiliaries. Um, and, and they would bring up extra manpower. So I brought, because this is hard to picture, and you know, we want to talk about this. This is the army that conquered the world. It knew what it was doing. Um, did you get the idea from the beginning of the Eagle of the Ninth that the army was exceedingly well run and yeah, everybody had a place, everybody knew what they were supposed to do. Um, so I brought this Osborne book in and it has some really cool illustrations. And one of them is the army. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold it. Um, I think you can see, uh, I don't know if I wanna take the time to pass it around. This is, this is a picture of what Elliot described. And I'm going to read part of this to you. It says, um, oh, where do I want to start? All right. Centuries were grouped into units called cohorts. The cohort was the main tactical unit. What does that mean? Men moved on the battlefield in cohorts. Ten cohorts made up a legion the largest fighting group. Um, it says in each legion, one cohort was larger than the others. That's the yellow one. It contained 10 centuries. Some of these were horseback messengers, cooks, or clerks, and did not normally fight. So, you know, I'm not an army person, but my son's in the army. And they have a lot of people that have to travel with them, even today. You know, they have to eat something. They, they need medical attention. My son was just doing some sort of tank maneuvers in California and the brake was bad on the tank and it stopped suddenly and threw his gunner out of his seat and bashed him against the wall and he had a concussion and knocked him out and they had to medevac him. You know, think about these people have to be a part of the army. So one, one of the cohorts is bigger. The other nine cohorts usually contain six centuries, making a total of 4,320 legionaries. Um, and then each century, is divided up too. Um, th then they talked about the standard bearers, and I thought this was important for us because of the Eagle of the Ninth. Each legion owned an eagle made of silver called an aquila. It was carried in battle by a soldier called an aquilifer. The eagle was a symbol of the legion's power. If the enemy captured it, the legion was disbanded, which is exactly what happened in the Eagle of the Ninth, isn't it? Um, was it in here or was it Wednesday? Did someone in here ask last week why it's such a big deal to get the Eagle? Did I have that conversation with you guys? Um, I'll read this sentence again. The Eagle was a symbol of the Legion's power. Have you ever seen a movie, oh, uh, some other war movie, it's often civil war movies, I feel like this happens. There's a guy holding the flag of their regiment and they're yelling, don't lose the flag, don't let the flag drop. It's the same thing. It's a symbol of your group of men. You know, if the Illinois, whatever, the third Illinois regiment marches south for the civil war and they've got their flag and this is their symbol and they don't want it to hit the ground. They don't want to lose it to the enemy, right? That's the same thing. So this is the army. This is the army that conquered the world, and they did something else too. I'm sorry, you guys are gonna have to be patient with me today as I juggle my books. Um, one important characteristic of the Roman army was its camp. 
The site was carefully chosen and was always within easy reach of food supplies, food, and water. Um, what do soldiers do when there's not a war? They build stuff. <clears throat> they build stuff. They build roads. They build bridges. And these Roman camps, uh, there's a picture in my book. Let's see if it's one of the flags I marked. These Roman camps were dotted. Oh, here we go. During the wars to secure the empire, legions spent many days on the march. When they stopped each night, they set up camp, then dismantled the following morning before moving on. The procedure was highly organized. The camp was always laid out in the same way. So everyone knew his part in building it. Josephus observed Roman tactics and fighting methods. His book, The Jewish War, tells us how the camps were built. First of all, they dig a ditch around it, build a palisade. They put a little wooden wall every night. You think it's hard when you go camping because you got to go collect firewood or something. These guys got to dig a ditch around the whole thing. Lay out uh, the main roads. And the reason I'm telling you about this is because these Roman camps all over Europe are where towns are now. When Marcus, um, this is a spoiler for if you haven't finished the Eagle of the Knights, but I was going to spoil it later anyway. Um, Marcus accomplished what he set out to do, and he got a reward. Uncle Aquila, interestingly, that Aquila's name means eagle, also got gifted when he left the army. What did they get gifted with? Land and money. Which more, more of which one? Uh, more of land. Uncle Aquila even made a comment. Ugh. The Senate is free with the land, but they're a little stingy with the money. When you do your term of service in the Roman army, they give you land. You do your 20 years, and you, you get a little farm. You get a home somewhere. But not necessarily in Italy, not in Rome, wherever. And just like they asked Marcus, they said, we could pull some strings and get you back to Italy if you want to be. But we can give you land in Britain because we conquered these people. We, we take a dim view of this today. You know, we, people already lived there, and they just moved in and took their land. This is not a new thing. America isn't the only people in history that came into where somebody else was already living and said, we're going to live here now. And they, and they would give away the land. And, and so these soldiers, sometimes a lot of them would retire at once. And they would basically tell them, go set up a town. And they would start the town just like a Roman camp because they'd spent 20 years building these, right? And so I want to show you this very cool book. Um, I super recommend, you can hound your mom to go to the library, but buying them is even better. Um, books by David McCauley. He was very popular. You have a couple of those? They were very popular back when, even before I had kids um, and when my kids were little. And he, he, he does these books with amazing illustrations. And there's one that's set in Egypt. There's a mill, like a, um, a water mill. Uh, there's a castle one. The city one is about a Roman city. These people are going to build a Roman city. And I just wanted to show you a few of the steps because it goes along with what we've been reading. They retire the soldiers um, on land. So. The soldiers and the slaves, I'm not going to read this whole book, but just a little bit. The soldiers and the slaves who's traveled with them set up a military camp called a castrum. So you're there. We've decided to build a city here. How do we start? We build a military camp. So we start every city. First, they dug a protective ditch and erected a stockade fence around a rectangular area. Next, the two main streets were marked off. One running north to south, the other from east to west. They crossed at right angles over a long, above a long open space called the Forum, where the soldiers would gather daily to receive their orders. At one end of the Forum, the commander's tent was pitched. The tents for soldiers, slaves, and supplies filled the remainder of the castrum and were grouped in rows. Just just what, what Dorothy Mills told us. They always 
lay it out perfectly. Now, you guys don't drive yet, but when you do, you will find out that some cities are really easy to get around in and some cities are not. Because some cities have blocks laid out. And sometimes if you're lucky, they're numbered or lettered instead of just random names. And it makes it very, very easy to get around. Some cities are not so carefully laid out and the roads just, roads don't go through. And then, and we have a combination of that in the Quad Cities, I feel like. Roman towns were very orderly. These were orderly people. So they always started out with this orderly camp. You have two main roads. They're called the Cardo and the Decumanus. The Cardo is the word for hinge, like a door hinge. It's what the whole city hinges on. Okay, so we start there, and then we lay out the entire city. Before we do anything, we know where all the streets are going to be. We know where the amphitheater and the theater Forum is in the middle, as they said. Everything is laid out before they start anything, because this is the Roman mind. Um, so the towns in Britain, the town where Uncle Aquila lives, this is a Roman town. And remember, Aunt Valeria, she really likes it. Katya's Aunt Valeria, she likes the orderliness. How's Katya feel about the orderliness? Not so much. Some people, do you have someone in your family that's just kind of naturally disordered and messy? You don't have to answer or point fingers. Maybe it's you. It's okay. Do you know what? It's not a moral issue. Um, I have one. She's probably never going to watch this. So, um, And she knows who she is. Uh, and, and the rest of us are all very neat and orderly. And she's just not her mind and her spirit gravitate towards disorder. And maybe Katya does too. But do you remember that Marcus and Eska compared designs, one on a dagger? Marcus's dagger was very orderly and symmetrical and all the things important to Rome. And Eska's was just wild with lots of swirls. If you ever um, see Celtic nodding, Celtic designs, this seems very orderly, but it's kind of swirly right? It's not like a Roman town. It's very complex. And, and so this is what the Romans did. Now, walls. Our city needs walls, as we know, because Cradock and his crazies may be outside. That was outside the, the army base, not the city. They may be invading. And uh, do you ever think about building a wall? Remember I told you Hadrian's wall? What did we say? It was 70 feet high and Eight feet thick, I think, that I read last week. How long does it take you to build a wall that's 70 feet high and eight feet thick? And more importantly, how much stone does this take? Yeah, well, you know what there was? There was dirt in the middle. They don't fill the whole thing with stone because that would be a waste of time. What we do is, in our new city, we dig two trenches... Remember how the Roman camp started? We got to dig a trench, and then we got to build a wooden palisade if we want more than wood. We just use the trench and the dirt that's in between the two trenches. It's filled with dirt. Think about it. Can, can you imagine tunneling through eight feet of dirt? I mean, pounded down dirt, not just loose dirt like in your garden. This is incredibly strong, and it saves time. They're smart. So we, we need, before we start building our town, we need protection. Because the locals may not like us building a town here. They're not all like Aunt Valeria, right? Some of them are not going to be very happy to see the Romans move in. So they've built their wall, and I'm just going to show you a few of the, the pictures as it goes on. And they begin to build the homes. Now, can you see an issue? They're building, they've built the wall already. What? Oh, that would be a bummer. <laughs> if you built a town, it's like throwing a party and no one came. Getting materials, depending on where they are. But I was thinking of a problem as the city grows. 
you, you can only expand up to the walls. Um, a lot of cities that started as very ancient cities, Roman or otherwise, have spilled out. You know, European cities have spilled out beyond the walls. Eventually, people just decide they want to live near the city. And it's OK if they're not inside the walls. But maybe if an enemy comes, we can run and get inside in the walls really quick. So this is sort of what happens in the Middle Ages. A castle and the surrounding buildings have a wall. And then the villagers just run into the castle area if they need to. But you've, you've sort of set limits, haven't you, when you built a wall? Only so many people are going to fit inside this, this city. So as time goes on, they continue to build. And one of the um, fabulous things, and I've talked about this before, is, is roads. First of all, we need roads that get to our town. Because, like Luke said, you want people to move in, right? And you want easy access. So, and we've talked about roads a little bit before. But the way they built them was incredible. We're going to see if I, yes, I did. OK, I might. Well, I'll, I'll read this, and then you can see it bigger in this picture. When planning a road, Roman surveyors looked for the shortest, straightest, flattest route. To find this, they took sites from one site's S-I-G-H-T site, sites from one high point to another. They probably did this by lighting fires, flares, or beacons, or observing carrier pigeons, or using a groma, a tool, to sight. You've, guys, you've seen people do this. Whenever they start painting orange lines by the side of the road, and the men are out with their tripod things, and they're staring through it, they're taking lines of sight. And, you, and, and somebody else is holding a pole. And you side up the pole, and you know how many feet, what the elevation of that place is. And they track it. And th this is how we build things today. They did the same, very similar. Once the route had been planned, turf and trees were cleared. Then a trench was dug about three and a half feet deep with layers of stone to prevent puddles, which would crack the road if they froze. We know all about this, don't we? Why are all the men out working on the roads now? Why did the, are there suddenly cracks in our roads after every winter? Because, well, we're in terror, but the water creeps in. And you know what happens to water when it freezes, right? It gets bigger. And it pushes out and it makes cracks. They know all of this. Um, to prevent puddles, the surface was built with a raised curve called a camber. And ditches were dug to drain the water away. Not curved enough that you would feel funny if you were walking on it, because it doesn't take much, right? Have you ever seen water trickle across a surface that you thought was pretty level, a table or something, and you realize the table is not level, or the water would not be moving? The roads were like that. And so uh, they filled the bottom with stones, smaller stones on top, then gravel, and then big stone slabs over the top. I'm going to. Actually, if you want to see that picture, because it's very cool. And I've told you this. Some of these roads are still being used today. And somewhere in there, it says, eventually, there was a network of 50,000 miles of roads all over the empire. It's amazing. But what do soldiers do when they don't have a battle? You got to be stationed on the frontiers just in case. So you might as well be building a road. And this is what they did with their time. Um, built cities and built roads. And wh why, we talked about this before, but let's visit it again. Why is having good roads helpful to a government? Why would having good roads be helpful to the Roman government? OK, supplies, obviously. How? How about messages? Something's happening 500 miles away, and you need to tell them in Rome. I want a way to get there fast. I want a way to get troops back there fast, if need be. I may have told you this, uh, and I, do, I don't remember the place. But this is early America, and they were talking about colonial times, that it took, oh, 
like a couple of weeks to get from New York to Pencil to Philadelphia or something like that when they're gathering for the Constitutional Convention because the roads were all mud and you get stuck and then people have to get out and push the carriage. It's awful. Preston is not joining us. Um, so the, when they build their city, they have to have roads, but they also want roads inside the city. We all know that good roads inside your town are helpful too. We, because we've all been there. There's some side roads that are gravel and kind of sketchy, you know, and they get really bad in the winter. You want, but you stay on the good roads, right? In the when the when the weather's bad, they built good roads like this inside the whole town. <clears throat> It wasn't just roads to get to the town. And I love this, it's amazing. Um, the sidewalks on both sides of the streets were raised one and a half feet above the road surface. This precaution prevented vehicles from accidentally rolling into the path of pedestrians. Stepping stones were embedded in the middle of the road to connect the sidewalks. Wouldn't you love that? I mean, our roads are paved their roads were paved, but sometimes it's wet. And you know, sometimes the puddles get really deep. If you have to cross from one sidewalk to another, they walk on stepping stones. They never have to get their feet wet. Ah, they're set apart just the right distance so carriage wheels can pass through. So, and we can't really do that. Can you imagine the nightmare of having stepping stones and how many people, how many wrecks there would be at every, yeah, we couldn't do that. Um, when it rained, oh, okay. Animals and carts could straddle the stones, but only if they went slowly. Have you ever been visiting someone who lives near a major road? Um, maybe you're not, you don't normally at home live near major roads and suddenly you're in a big city or something and it's noisy all night. People are going past. Uh, my, my husband's parents live on the main road in their town. It's a small town, but it's the main road through town. And we live in the country. And when I sleep there, like, shoot, there are cars going by all night long. And I hear them all night long. So only if they went slowly. Slowly means people are safer. Slowly means there's less noise. Um, when it rained, the streets were the gutters through which water ran into sewers under the sidewalks. I don't know if I, um, I'm not going to look for it. This is a picture showing the, the piping, um, bringing water in. They had, just like we do, it, you know this, um, the, at the corners or in the edges of sidewalk, the little holes, you know, where the water pours down and an underground sewer system. The Romans had this. The Romans had this 2,000 years ago. The stepping stones enabled people to cross the street without getting their sandals drenched. The Cardo and Decumanus, the two main roads were finished first. Other streets were completed as the area around them developed. It was a very, I must say, I don't like to say advanced because it was a modern setup. I don't know what, what else to call it. We're not so smart. <laughs> And, and we have all sorts of machinery to help us do it. And they had to do it by hand. We have computers now. I, I, when I was in college, I had to take a class where we cited, you know, we mapped sites. And I used one of those tripod things and the, held the pole and everything. Um, but now I'm sure it's all, you know, computer citing and laser pointers can just point right to it. They had none of this. Okay. So... Next up, we fill our town with buildings. People want to move in and they need homes. And here is a house plan. Roman houses were long and they faced the street. Here's the street, okay? And in the back of the house, there was always a garden. So the, the front of your house, you know, sometimes we like to decorate our fronts of our houses. A long time ago, people had big front porches and people would sit out and you, uh, Quad Cities is filled with old houses with these beautiful big front porches. Now people don't do that as much. But we sort of like to make the front of our house pretty, right? We plant flowers and things. They didn't care. The front of your house faces the street 
and you don't want windows, you don't want to look out at the carts going by and all the people. You want it in the back. And so in the back, they have a garden. They have an atrium with a hole in the wall. I think we should renew this in our house. A hole for the rainwater to drain through. And the, it would fill the pool. But it was open air. It's like uh, having a, a three-season porch, you know, that's screened in all the time. You just go to the atrium. Uh, depending on where they are. If they're in Britain, maybe not. Maybe they could put a roof over it. I don't know about that. Uh, but So what do they do at the front? They rent it out. They rent it out to stores. So this is Marcus Licinius. This is his beautiful house. And what happens in the front of his house? He rents it out. He rents it out to a guy that just has a little shop and he opens the window and he sells bread or whatever. And he pays rent to Marcus Licinius. So as you're walking by in the street, there's it's lined with shops. Behind these shops are the houses. It's actually a pretty convenient way to set things up. And you can use, you can put a lot in a small space. Um, notice Marcus Licinius's house. He has his own uh, sewer system. He has his own drainage because a lot of these nice houses have uh, not flush toilets exactly but a, a sewer to carry around the waste and you can just dump water down it and it rinses everything out. They say that people in Rome lived better than people were going to do until the 19th century in Europe, again, after the fall of Rome. More cleaner and more healthy because these towns were so amazing. So after a while, when they filled it and they built their amphitheater, we have a Roman town. And a thousand years after this, this may be a European city today because so many of them started this way. So this is the army. The army, so when, when she said, so back to Dorothy Mills, when she said, what are the tools, when I asked you what are the tools that they used, the army isn't just a tool for conquering people. Does that make sense? The, this is the manpower that builds all of this stuff. And so you've got um, stations to govern the local people, to know what's going on. Okay. Does anybody, before we move on, does anyone want to add anything about the army? Okay. Um, building. That was the, I don't know if that was the second thing you said, but that's the next thing we're going to talk about. Uh, Building, what was their engineering breakthrough? Elliot, give it to me. Arches. Arches can span a large amount of space without having to have a bunch of columns in between. Um, they make these for little kids now, these sets of blocks where you can build an arch. I used to see them in catalogs when my kids were little. You know, do you know how they make an arch? How, how do you get the stones to stay? Okay. Yes, do you know what? A lot of times they do that now. Not always. Sometimes they do it the old school way. If they want it to be really beautiful. No. Because it, it, it would, then you'd have to have stone there, right? It's very cool. My husband is an engineer. I don't understand how to make things stand up, but he helps me or tells me when they're about to fall down. Um, if I want to build an arch between these two um, pillars, these two sides, first of all, I've got to have something to lay my stones on. So I build a framework, this is not going to be very symmetrical, out of wood, right? And now I'm going to stack my blocks. I'm not going to draw all these in, okay? But you see, so I'm, I'm stacking the blocks, and as I, they're going to have to change shape slightly, aren't they? Do you see how they're going to have to be narrower on one end and fatter on the other? They're going to have to be chiseled just so. But when I get to the top, and this is the amazing part. Oh, I'm so, I'm, I just apologize 
for my drawing. Okay, let's do this. All right, this is not good. I have a space, and this is the most important space of all. I have a stone that is just the right shape. And when I put that stone in, it presses on all these other stones and carries the forces, and the whole thing will stand up by itself. If your stones are, are shaped the right way, putting this in, this capstone, will hold it all together. Then you can take off the wood. You can take out the wood. And this freestanding arch will hold up by itself. Like I said, I used to see sets of blocks for kids to build an arch and put the capstone in. It's very cool. I, it doesn't make sense to me at all. It makes sense to my husband. Um, but we also talked about their domes. So often what they were doing is they're putting some, and then they're covering it with concrete. Concrete, which is a lot cheaper, frankly, than cutting out the stones. But if I want it to be particularly beautiful, I can make a freestanding arch. The Roman engineers figured this out. They figured out how to do it. They were brilliant at making things, making things work. Um, so just like we talked about domes, um, you could have a very, very large area with no columns holding up. You can you now use these to build bridges and aqueducts and all of these building projects that the Romans built. <clears throat> and so um, what structure did they build on a larger scale than any other previous people? What was your answer to that one? Aqueducts, which are a kind of something else. Well, because when we think of aqueduct, we're thinking of the part where it crosses the river, probably. Because the whole thing is an aqueduct, right? But we're picturing the part where it's very spectacular looking and it's crossing. What is that thing? It's a bridge. They built bridges. She says they were the first people to build bridges on a large scale. It is thought the Babylonians were the first to make use of the arch in building, but they had not developed it very far. The Greeks hardly used it. You know, those square, rectangular, flat-topped, with a pediment roof in the temples. No curves. No curves. And this made them able to build those aqueducts on a large scale and bridge rivers and bridge valleys and make those roads passable. It, it was an amazing system. Um, okay, our other tool was law. So after the Roman Empire fell, which we'll kind of finish it off next week, there, was, there were still emperors in the East, and one of them named Justinian. He gathered all the Roman laws. The laws were written down in different books, you know, and it was hard to keep track of because they weren't all in one place. And sometimes the laws, one person said you could do something and another place said you couldn't. And so Justinian had it all gone through, organized, put in books. And that law system that was the Roman law system was the basis for all European law, all the way up to modern times, all through the Middle Ages. Where did their ideas of law come? Rome. Where do our ideas of law come? Rome. Even the idea that you should be able to speak up for yourself in trial. Um, I think I told you the story of a man who, it was when Catiline tried to overthrow the government and Cicero had the conspirators executed without a trial. I got in trouble for that. These guys were the pioneers. And here's something special about the law. In the eyes of the law, those who dwelled within the empire were not members of different nations. There was no difference made between races, but all were Romans. It was under the great emperors that certain principles of justice and humanity were firmly planted at the root of the law. 
principles which are still at the foundation of all civilized law today. We in America tend to think of ourselves as pretty progressive, you know, and um, all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And we work towards that ideal, better and worse, but working always towards better, I think. We're not the first people with that ideal. And our founding fathers knew it. It did not matter eventually in the Roman Empire whether you were Gaul. Remember we saw Vespasian was Italian. Trajan was from Spain. They didn't care anymore. Eventually, everybody in the empire got Roman citizenship. In Paul's time, it was still kind of a big deal in the book of Acts. Eventually, it wasn't. We're all Roman citizens. And they just didn't care. Everybody spoke Latin if you had any sort of education, but they still spoke their local languages and had their own customs. But it didn't matter. You were all the same under the law. And I guess we don't think that's a big deal because that's our ideal. But that's not the way it's been in most of history, that you foreigners, I don't know if we should treat you the same. Eventually, the Romans said, yeah, we're going to treat you all the same. Same laws. All right. Uh, and then I need to throw in, this was not one of the tools, but this she talked about the Latin language. Latin and Greek were the two big languages of the empire. And um, when, when the empire, the two halves started going their own way, the eastern half just basically spoke Greek and the western half kept speaking Latin. And they got to the point where nobody in the West really knew how to speak Greek anymore. But Latin was the foundation always. And some of you are my Latin students. Right? Um, and you know that, that a lot of words in English come from Latin, don't they? So many words. Up until, and, and you need to understand something, up until a couple of hundred years ago, maybe 300 years ago, 250, people in Europe were still writing books in Latin. I hate it. I hate it when people say, Latin is a dead language. Well, if so, it had the it was closer to immortal than any other language on the face of the earth, because people used it for a couple thousand years. They still used Latin in Europe because everybody with an education learned it. If I live in Germany and you live in Spain, I can't talk to you. We're scientists, and when we want to share research, if I write it in Latin, we both can. Isaac Newton wrote his famous book about his laws of gravitation in Latin. The, this has been the basis of our knowledge, our learning. I read a statistic somewhere, I can't remember what it was, but it was at least 50% of the stuff written in Latin has never been translated. Stuff, medieval things. Um, I showed you that book my son got me for Christmas that was published in Venice. It's in Latin, 1587. It's in Latin. It's that You have to read it in Latin if you want to read it. So this gives us access. This is my pitch for Latin. But th this gives us access to, to the riches of what they knew, what has been written. But this is the longest, this in Greek, I suppose, the longest lived language. Okay. I don't know about Chinese, or I don't know about Asian languages. I'm not up on Asian history at all. But as far as the Western world goes, these are the longest lived languages. Greek is very nuanced, and it's very, uh, there's lots of ways to express ideas. Latin, though, is very, it's highly organized, right? Luke, those endings, you put, slap those endings on, and, and that is a subject. That is a direct object. There's no messing around, because that's what the Romans were like. There's no messing around. We're very orderly. Um, so that is another thing that Dorothy Mills mentioned, the fact that Latin, they gave us a heritage that lasted for over another thousand years after the fall of the Roman Empire. People were still using their language. 
scientists and, and scholars. Okay, so that was the first section we read. The second section is a sad story, isn't it, of things falling apart. We've gone from Augustus, who got things organized, who pulled Rome back from the brink of more civil war and gave peace to the empire. And then it grew and grew. And in the early 100s, we had Trajan and Hadrian and everything's very orderly. It's a well-oiled machine like an eagle of the ninth. And then in the 200s, things start to go bad. Um, during the great days of the empire, the frontiers had been kept safe. But the barbarian tribes who lived beyond the Roman boundaries were growing stronger and more threatening to the peace of the empire. In spite of the wealth of Rome, the money needed for defense was difficult to raise, and the taxes became increasingly heavy and oppressive. How do people feel about taxes? How do your parents feel about taxes? Do they like April? Are they just really happy in April? They got to pay their taxes? Maybe they get something back. But it was their money to begin with, even if you get something back. No, nobody likes to pay taxes. And we aren't actually taxed nearly as heavily as people have been throughout history. And if you've got thousands of miles of border, and you've got a station guys there because those crazy Germans keep coming across, it costs a lot of money. So we tax you. The provinces were decreasing in population for pestilences. Do you know what a pestilence is? <laughs> oh. Sickness, disease, plague. Famine and war had wrought havoc among the inhabitants. The decrease in population made it difficult to till the land. And what happens when there's not enough people to farm? There's no food. Do you see the spiral? Another source of danger to the empire lay in the frequent civil wars over the election of emperors. And then I asked you to do a little math for me. You like that? This is apparently math day. Um, between 180 and 284, there were 29 emperors, only four of whom died natural deaths. 25 murdered ones and four natural deaths. Okay, anybody do the math? How was the average reign? Give it to me, Liam. Three to four years, three, to four years, three and a half years. Average rule. Less than the term of our president. Now, that's an average. Some of them ruled longer and some ruled only a year. But, but an average, that's not good. Yeah, very good. It is math day. Oh my goodness, yes. 25 out of 29. Yes. And so the question in my mind, which Dorothy Mills and no one else can answer, I think. Well, I can use my imagination. Who wants to be emperor for crying out loud? I, they'd have to pay me to take it. And I'm not sure I'd take it then. But there is a certain attraction to being the emperor, you know. And maybe you'll be one of the four lucky ones. You know, you never know. Uh, it was a mess. Um, after Marcus Aurelius, his son Commodus, we talked about this, he, he chose his son, his biological son, shouldn't have done it. Commodus was murdered, and an emperor Pertinax was put in place, but he too was murdered. Then followed one of the most disgraceful scenes in all of Roman history. The office of emperor was sold at auction to the highest bidder. Nothing to say about that. Oh, my goodness. For 50 years, there was constant civil war over succession to the Rome. This weakened Rome within, obviously, and in consequence withdrew large numbers of soldiers from the frontiers. Right? Where am I going to get people to fight in these civil wars? Oh, I have to call those guys back from the frontiers. Why don't you come help us here? Do you think the 
barbarians on the other side? I'm, I'm calling them barbarians because that's what the Romans would call them. I'm sure they were, I was going to say that, I'm sure they were nice people. I don't think some of the Germans were nice people at all, quite frankly, but um, they they know. The defenses are down and they start pouring across the border. And you know, it's easier, we all know this, it's easier to keep something in place than it is to fix it after it falls apart. So it's better to maintain than it is to, to fix the damage. It was a mess. Um, in 270, Aurelian, ah, oh, your coin, became emperor. He gave Dacia to the Visigoths. Dacia is, uh, this is Greece, and this is Italy. Dacia is up here. Okay, it's from the north. The first land lost to the Roman Empire. Remember my little video where the, it, the empire grew and it started shrinking? This is the point where it starts shrinking. So now I bring out one of my other books. This is a bunch of maps throughout the history of Rome. And it's very enlightening to look at these maps. Um, and sometimes a little confusing, quite frankly. So here's a map, 250 to 271. Okay, this is the time period we're talking about. I'm going to bring it around because I feel like you should see it. All the lines, okay, there are, there are orange lines that are frontiers, okay, and that's obvious. But there's a bunch of lines with arrows. These are all invasions. So can you guys look together? Look at all. This, this just shows it much better than I can describe. Everywhere. These, the entire northern border. See all the arrows? These are the tribes coming in. Holy cow. I know. Holy cow. And they have dates of, of major battles. Oh, Dacia. There we go. North of Greece. And the hatched, if you want to. Crazy. It, it it's awful. Here, Preston, do you want to look? Preston is very tired today. It's a mess. And um, so you can imagine, I don't know, maybe we can't imagine, the turmoil involved in um, living in a time like that. I'm thinking of uh, the time when the Vikings were rampaging in from 700 to 900 or 700 to 1,000 or something like that. And I, I always say this in my, in my medieval year, imagine living, thinking that at any moment you might get word that somebody is burning and pillaging Peoria and they're headed this way. And you got as long as it takes these guys to march from Peoria to here, to either barricade yourself somewhere or grab everything you can carry and skedaddle and get out of their way. Because they will kill you and burn your house down and, 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 and maybe kidnap your, your wife and your daughters. And Can you imagine? At any moment, a messenger might come and say, yeah, Peoria on fire. You guys better get out or you're going to be dead. That's what life was. I can't, I, can't, I can't even imagine, you know, and I fear there are people living that way, places in the globe, you know, places in Africa that have suffered from civil war for, for decades. And you just, at any moment, insurgents may be rising up and, and headed your way. And I feel like this, this is what Rome, the Roman Empire is living under, but especially those people on the borders. This, this one I'm about to tell you is a little later than this time period, but we have messages sent from Britain. Because where's Britain? Way out there. If we're going to abandon somebody, it's going to be Britain. Because <laughs> it takes a long time to get there. And so in the you know 400s, they were also being invaded by Angles and Saxons. And they, they sent for help. Send more soldiers. We need help. And they said, you know what? We got a lot on our hands here. You're just going to have to deal with it yourself. And one of the messages was sort of the effect of, what are you, a bunch of lazy, good for nothings? Defend yourselves already. Did you learn nothing from us all the years that we were with you, the centuries we were in Britain? 
deal with it yourself. That's what the people on the frontiers, this is the sort of messages you start getting. It's not good. Um, but we're talking about the late 200s. The empire is going to limp along for 200 more years, as long as the United States has been. It's still going to keep pushing forward. You know, I feel like something has to be pretty doggone strong to withstand that much pressure and hang on for so long, if you know what I mean. Okay. So eventually, the empire, there's so much going on, they can't deal with all those arrows. And they've got to do something. Diocletian, this is the next question I asked you. Diocletian came up with a plan to more effectively govern such a large area. What did he decide to do? I'm going to let anybody wants a shot at it. All right. I think, okay, it's probably Liam and then Elliot, you can have the next one. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. And he split the empire into east and west. So I'm going to talk, um, but bring this around. This is color coded. The split is basically um, sort of between Italy and Greece. Okay, and, and I know there's no real split there, but there's a bunch of colors because the, the east and west, then he divided into smaller well, states or provinces, whatever we would call it today, each under a governor. And then each of those is subdivided. Um, the smallest subdivision was called a diocese, which is why the Catholic Church still calls the area over which a bishop has jurisdiction a diocese. It's a Roman term because when the government fell apart, the dioceses were still there, and the only person with any authority at all was the bishop. <laughs> and um, and so it's sort of like the bishops stepped into the place of the governors. Okay, so this is a map of the empire, and this is color-coded. These are the, the main divisions. The, I mean, the first big division is east and west. And then he's divided it up, and um, so as uh, Liam said, you know, we got to stop killing emperors and just making ourselves emperor. That just doesn't work. And so what we should do is have what, a vice president. Mm, mm. Um, so each east and west has what we call an Augustus. He's the head emperor, you know. And then uh, below that is the Caesar, vice president. And so when the Augustus dies, the Caesar is just ready to step up. And it's an awesome plan. It, if it had worked, it would have been great. But unfortunately, the um, Augusti and the Caesars didn't always get along with each other, you know? And <laughs> it didn't stop them from fighting. Which takes us to Diocletian and beyond. Diocletian and his co-ruler both chose a Caesar. And then they retired. Well, yeah. Um, Diocletian decided, it sounds like maybe his Caesar, actually, perhaps his Caesar encouraged him to retire so he could take over. Anyway, be that as it may, nobody killed him. That's progress. He actually retired and lived. And so did the other Caesar. Um, and uh, the or the other Augustus. And the Augustus in the West is in Britain. He, his name is Constantius Chlorus. And it seems a good enough guy. Competent and not mean, you know. But the guy in the East was, was terrible. And Constantine, Constantius had a son named Constantine. Yeah, that's, this is, your coin is from this guy's. The grandson of Constantius Chlorus. Okay. Um, Constantine was in the East and he asked the um, uh, Augustus there, who I think was Maximin, uh, can I go home to be my dad? No. So Constantine steals a horse and he just gets on a horse and he rides across Gaul and he gets a boat to Britain. Then his dad dies. Constantine is not the Caesar, but everybody wants him to be the next Augustus. 
so he gets to be the next Augustus. The system doesn't work. Well, in the meantime, a guy named Maxentius had just taken Rome and decided he was just going to set himself up as the ruler in Rome. He was kind of making a grab for, I'm going to be the next Caesar, I'm going to be the next Augustus. And he was really nasty. And the people in Rome said, Constantine, will you please come help us? You betcha I will. So he starts marching towards Rome. Now, the famous story about Constantine is that on the march, <clears throat> he had a vision of some sort. Whether he dreamed it or he was awake, nobody knows. He had a vision, and in the sky, he saw um, either a cross. He saw a Christian symbol of some sort, okay? Either a cross, but in a lot of, I'm going to show you this because, um, a lot of versions say this, the Cairo symbol. So if you've ever seen this, I don't know if you've ever seen this. It could be on a on an altar table, depending on the kind of church that you attend. Or um, it's called the chi rho symbol because those are the two Greek letters chi and rho, and they're also the first two letters Christ in in Greek. So he he saw this or a cross, and underneath in hoc. Signo unces. In this sign, you will conquer. So he wakes up or he comes back from this vision. And he says, okay, I think the Christian God is speaking to me. I've just gotten a message from, from God. And I think he wants me to put that sign on my army shields and on the standards. So we're going to either crosses or Cairo symbols, whichever one it was, on all the shields and a standard, and we're gonna march into battle against Maxentius. Maxentius had broken down the bridge across the Tiber River so that nobody could get into Rome, but then he decided he wanted to go across the Tiber River and fight Constantine, because he felt really good about himself, you know? But he already broke the bridge. So he did one of the where you tie boats together and made a boat bridge. No, they always fall apart. They never learn, do they? So they went across the bridge and they fight Constantine. Constantine just blows them away. Constantine wins, hands down. Maxentius and his army are trying to scurry themselves back across the boat bridge, but they always fall apart, right? And it did. And they're falling in the water. They're drowning. Maxentius drowns. You know, they got the, the heavy armor. They've got armor and, and weapons, and they just sink like stones. They're drowning all over the place. Constantine is wildly victorious. And then eventually marches east to take care of the nasty guy in the east. And I, I should say why I keep calling him the nasty guy. Terrible persecutor of Christians. Terrible persecutor of Christians. Can you see why the guy who thinks God talked to him, that Jesus won the battle for him, wants to go for the guy who's a terrible persecutor of Christians? This makes sense. Some of the worst persecutions ever were during this time in the East. Eventually, Constantine comes out on top. He defeats Maximin. He defeats all the guys in the East. And he, he has a co-ruler, Galerius. Um, I think Galerius, sorry. But it's Constantine pretty much in charge. And Constantine did a couple things. First of all, he decided he needed a new city. Rome, you know, is just chock full of pagan temples and stuff. But there was this nice little Greek colony up on the Black Sea called Byzantium. It's perfect. I mean, yeah, it was a pagan colony, but it's not full of pagan temples like Rome. Plus, things aren't going very well in the West with all these barbarian hordes rushing across the borders. So I'm just going to build a new town. Let's have a new capital. And hey, let's name it after me, Constantinople. I like that. It's got a nice ring to it. That 
capital, Constantinople, is going to be the capital of a Roman Empire in the East that's going to go on until 1453. Another thousand years after the fall of the West. It's a long time. 1453, 1492 is Columbus. It only fell 40 years before Columbus sailed. I mean, that really puts it in perspective. Oh my goodness. They were about to discover the New World, and there was still a Roman emperor in Constantinople. The other thing he did, I asked you a question about. What did the Edict of Milan pronounce? Oh, I said Elliot could have it. Christianity is fully legal. Christians, you have been hiding for years. Remember I told you, they weren't persecuted all the time for 300 years. But when it happened, it was really bad. A lot of people died. And they didn't just kill him. They tortured him to death. It was really bad. They had the lovely, we, we put hooks in you and drag you through the streets till you die. What? It was awful. They had churches, but every time persecution waves came along, they just took away all their stuff. They took away their churches. So this was amazing to the Christian community. What? We're, we're free to worship? We don't have to hide? They're not going to kill us anymore? Concede said, yeah, plus, if anybody took away churches from them, give them back. And they don't have to pay you. If you bought it from somebody else, tough. Suck it up. You lost the money because you're giving it back. He even gave large gifts of money to certain churches in the bigger cities to help rebuild. Constantine, however, in addition to these things, uh, the reason he's called Constantine the Great, we've talked about this, there aren't very many of the greats. Alexander the Great, Peter the Great in Russia, Constantine the Great. I'm trying to think of another great. Um, there was a problem in the church when Constantine was ruling, and it was this. There was a man in Alexandria in Egypt, and his name was Arius. And Arius got to thinking about God and Jesus, and he decided that, you know what, this whole Jesus being God thing, that doesn't make any sense. Because then isn't it kind of like there's more than one God? So here's what I think, said Arius. I think Jesus was created. He's special. God made him first. But the same as God? I don't think so. And he started teaching this in churches. He was a priest. And a lot of people liked it. They said, you know what? That makes so much more sense to me. Because let's be honest, it is very hard hard, if not impossible, for us to comprehend how God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are all God, but they're not the same person, but they share an essence of some sort that we don't understand. This is hard. But God made a special creature called Jesus. This I can, this I can handle. This makes sense to me. So people agree. Like, yeah, I think Arius is right. The Arians weren't very nice. And they went around and they started stealing churches away from the, the Christians that didn't believe them. So Constantine thought this was lousy. He just got a message from God. And he wanted to be supportive of the church. And he could see it was getting ripped apart. And he said, here's what we're going to do. We're all going to meet. All the bishops and priests, everybody in the church that can meet. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, it's called the first ecumenical. It, it's the first ecumenical, but it's got a precedent in the book of Acts, the Council of Jerusalem. What did they do in, in, in Acts when they couldn't decide, what do we do with these Gentiles? They keep converting. Do we make them get circumcised? Do they have to follow the food rules? What's the deal? And they had a council. So ecumenical means church-wide. 318 bishops traveled to the town of Nicaea, which isn't very far from Constantinople. Some of the guys who came were missing 
eyes or limbs from torture during the persecution. These guys were hardcore martyrs is what they were. You know, I think we talked about this. Martyr means a witness. Today, we always think a martyr died. But for them, it was if you held up under torture or imprisonment or threats or whatever, and you did not deny Jesus, you're a martyr. You're a witness to the truth. So these witnesses were showing up, and they meant business. This is a faith I was willing to lose body parts for. And Constantine said, I know I'm not a churchman, I'm not a clergyman, but I'm going to oversee the council because it is in the best interests of the empire that there's peace in the church. So Arius and his crew got up and gave their peace. And then the bishops who disagreed with him stood up and gave their peace. And the church said, no, Arius is wrong. That is not what we have been teaching. This is in the year 325. That's not what we've been teaching for 300 years. That is not the faith that has been handed down to us. You are wrong. And they put together at this council and, and, and following one. What today we know is the Nicene Creed. Many churches, many of you probably know this very well because you say it every week. And if you notice, um, the section about Jesus is very, very long. You know, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, his only son. Okay, and then it launches into a very long God from God, light from light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, of one essence with the Father, by whom all things were made. It's very specific. And you might say this sometime and think, why are they going on and on? I mean, not that Jesus isn't worth it, you know, but it's just light of light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one essence with the Father, by whom all things were made. They just really, really describe him very specifically in this. And this is the reason why. They wanted to make sure no Aryan ideas could creep in. Jesus is God. So the Aryans, who I need to get a move on because we've got Eagle of the Night to talk about too. I've done it again. Rambled around. And, um, they, they decided they wanted to choose a word that would describe it perfectly. And the word they chose was homoousios. Um, the same essence. So uh, in English, we say consubstantial or of one essence with the Father. That's this word. And the Arians are like, we don't like that word. We don't think that word is ever in the Bible. Let's, let's use a different word. Let's use homoi usios. <laughs> One letter difference. This means the same essence. This means similar. You know, same and similar are not the same, are they? Same and similar. If I want, you know, chocolate ice cream, I want something the same. Frozen yogurt is similar. <laughs> One frozen yogurt. Um, this was cast down. This was voted for. Unfortunately, it didn't stop the Aryans. The Aryan problems kept going on and on. A poor guy who attended this council named Athanasius eventually became the next bishop of Alexandria. And he spent his 50 years as bishop uh, in exile five different times. They kept driving him away from his bishopric and he went into exile, sometimes on the run literally on the run, because if they caught him, they were going to execute him or punish him. Um, so, but back to our main topic, which is Constantine. Constantine is known for these things, but he's also known for the idea that when you just open up the doors to the church and maybe even encourage people to become Christians, you, you get a lot of people who don't really necessarily believe it completely. The emperor is a Christian. And I may say to myself, you know, if I tell people I'm a Christian, it will get me a good job in the government. And it, this happened. This happened. Um, and so Constantine gets a bad rap sometimes. 
that the church was better off when it was being persecuted and it was small and Constantine married the church and the government to each other. I don't know if that's fair. But Constantine is a controversial figure in some places. But it's, it's hard to look down on a guy who stopped persecution and encouraged the church in every way, materially and also in its right beliefs. So, and his mom, St. Helena, found uh, a piece, found the true cross. Um, so she's also a saint. Um, after Constantine, there was no real official persecution ever again except once. And Constantine had a nephew named Julian, and he grew up with his cousins, you know, but the, one of whose coin you have. And, and actually some of the great uh, church fathers of the East, um, I think you know, Basil, oh, he's a great too, Basil the Great, and um, one of the Gregories, um, they went to school together in Athens. And everybody thought Julian was a pretty decent, upstanding guy and a Christian. And, and then he got to be emperor because his cousins all died. And he said, oh, no, we're reviving paganism now. We're all going to be pagans again. He's known to history as Julian the Apostate. Apostate means you fell away from the faith. And But he didn't, there was some persecution, but he was much more subtle than that. He said, here's my new rule. Christians aren't allowed to teach literature in the schools anymore. If you're a Christian teacher, you now lose your job. Because he knew what you teach kids changes the world. We don't want those Christians teaching our kids. So he threw them out of the schools. And uh, fortunately, I guess, for Christianity in the world, he went east to fight those pesky Parthians, Persians, and died there in battle. And there's two stories of his death, but the most famous one is that he grabbed blood from his wound and flung it at the sky and said, you have conquered, O Galilean, and then died. I don't know. Um, but after that, there was no formal persecution. Um, so that is, the Roman Empire is obviously headed downhill. Next week, we will finish her off. <laughs> we'll talk about what happened. But let's talk about Eagle of the Ninth. We might also have, I know I had you finish it this week, but we might, our discussion of that might feed into next week because I've got to read my poem first and then we'll talk about that. It's the Praetorian Guard, which I didn't mention, but was in your section about the Roman army. They're the soldiers who guard the emperor himself. The Praetorian Guards were lean and mean, the emperor's personal army. The Roman emperor bragged to his friends, they'll never let anyone harm me. The Praetorian guards kept gaining more power. Their influence grew ever stronger. One day the guards quite scornfully said, we're protecting the emperor no longer. The Praetorian guards, once loyal and true, turned traitor, a real about face. They killed any emperor they didn't like and chose who would rule in his place. Which is pretty accurate. All right. I have marked a few things I wanted to mention, and then I wanted to talk about conflict. Um, actually, let's read this, and then that will launch me into that discussion quite nicely. So, Marcus and Esca are on the run. They've got the eagle tied up in, a, in some clothing and, and tucked into his little pouch, and they... Everybody knows where it is. They are running. Marcus's leg is starting to hurt. And, um, and this actually takes place slightly before they know. <laughs> Do you remember? Great plan. We'll steal it and hide it. We'll go around to the other side of the lake. You go across and grab it. Because when we leave, they'll search us. And we don't want to have it. And then they'll cross us off their list of potential people who have the eagle. And we're, it's golden. <coughs> so his host came. Why did you steal the eagle? We didn't steal the eagle. Search us if you want to. And he says, uh, we 
Marcus says to him, search our packs. Together they watched their few possessions tumbled on the grass, a couple of cloaks, a cooking pot, some strips of smoked deer meat flung out with rough haste. The lid of the bronze medicine box was wrenched back and one of the hunters began to rummage inside like a little dog after a rat. Marcus said quietly to the chieftain who stood beside him with folded arms, also looking on, will you bid your hounds be less rough with the tools of my trade? It may be that there are still sore eyes in Albu, although your small son's eyes are well. Ouch. I cured your son's eyes. And you're rummaging through my stuff like I'm a comic thief. Of course, we know he is. Too. But shames him. And then after they leave, he says this. It says, Marcus did not move at once. He stood gazing after the dwindling specks up the glen with a queer regret while his hand mechanically soothed and fondled his upset and angry mare. Do you wish the eagle yet in the place we took it from? Eska asked. Marcus was still watching those dwindling specks almost out of sight now. No, he said. If it were yet in the place we took it from, it would still be a danger to the frontier, a danger to other legions. Also, it was my father's eagle and none of theirs. Let them keep it if they can. Only, it is in my heart that I wish we need not have made Durgdian and his sword brethren ashamed. You shamed him. You know, I, I cured your son's eyes. You know, you were our hosts. We were your guests. You don't treat guests this way. He had to. But I'd like to ask you, what does that tell you about what kind of person Marcus is? Doesn't want to needlessly hurt other people, does he? Is he brave? He's brave. He, is he, is he um, willing to sacrifice and do his duty? Yeah. He's not soft. People would say he's all soft and emotional. Can you be both? Can you, I mean, apparently you can. Think about other people's feelings. He just sent this, he lived with him for, I don't know, several weeks anyway, they were there. He lived with him and, and now he's publicly shamed him. And he, he was right. They did take it. So this got me thinking about types of conflict. Do you remember when way back in September, August last year, I had you um, retelling stories and we did it in three paragraphs and we had the, who's in this story and where do they live? And then we had, what do they want? What do they need? And then we finished up, well, how does it all turn out? Do you remember that? And we talked about the fact that if you have no middle paragraph, if you have no what do they want and what do they need, it's a really boring story. A story with no what we call conflict. Just turns out to be a really, really boring story. And, and you can have several different kinds of conflict, right? One is you can have, we call it man versus man. Tell me some man versus man in the Eagle of the Night. There's tons of them. Go ahead, Andrew. Or did you say something? Okay, so the um, the chase. Okay, I'll just I'll just sum this up. So yes, they were fighting the men in the watchtower. Who else? Were two men fighting? Yeah, with Kradok. Okay, so the beginning fight with Kradok. Um, it doesn't have to be a knockdown, drag out fight. It doesn't have to be physical, in other words. Can you think of two characters that just didn't get along? At Placidus. Esca and Placidus. Placidius, I think his name is Placidius. I don't know. Also, Marcus and Placidius. 
You know, he, this guy was the rude tribune. So they didn't fight. They didn't get along. Eska ended up fighting uh, as a gladiator. That was a man against man. They didn't even know each other, but it was a physical fight. Um, in some sense, he fought against the old grandpa who was putting toad fat in the in the grandson's eyes. You know, and fought him to use the use the medicines. They got two other characters that Katya and her aunt Valeria, and they don't physically fight, but <clears throat> they obviously don't get along. Yes. <clears throat> um, so this is a book full of man versus man all over the place. Another popular sort of conflict to put in is man versus nature. Um, can you think of natural hurdles? Yes, Gern took them through that swamp. That would be terrifying to think. Don't stop too long or you will sink. Ha, oh, go ahead. Yeah, you know what? I, that could be the third one, but I'm, I like that because it, it's he's angry at his own leg. It's not sort of like being angry with your heart and feeling things. Yeah, we'll, we'll put his leg in there. Um, how about uh, just all that travel uh, in the north? Uh, that I'm about to read your lovely journals on. They have to sleep out in the open. They have to find food. Um, fighting against hunger and thirst. Those are natural things, right? Um, oh, do you remember at the beginning uh, when they're at the watchtower before Marcus gets hurt? What keeps them from seeing the enemy? Do you remember? Mist, fog. And they're fighting the fog and they're tense. They're tense. What? It's always fog. Fog is kind of creepy. It really is, because you just it could be right there and you don't know. It's very creepy. Um, but the one I just read, I feel like, is the third one. And it's really kind of gets deep and rich. Man versus himself. Arguing inside yourself about something. Do you ever do it? I bet you do. You want to do two different things and you're not sure which one you should choose. Or you know you're behaving poorly and that you should behave better. And part of you is telling the other part to stop it and be obedient or be pleasant when you don't feel like it. We all do this. And and I love that that passage where he says, I wish we hadn't had to shame him. He's fighting it himself. He's, he's feeling guilt, isn't he, over, the, over shaming his, his host. I thought of another man versus nature. Eska has to swim and fight the cold in the water. Can you think of other times? Actually, since it's 1030, here's what we're going to do. You're going to finish Dorothy Mills this week. And next week, we're going to spend some time looking at characters in the Eagle of the Ninth that argued with themselves, that were of two minds. And, and there's a lot of them. So if you think of them, you could even write some down if you want to. But if you don't, that's okay. This is an assignment. It's just for you to think about. Because um, I talk too much about everything else. And, uh, and next week, we'll just polish off the Roman Empire, and then we'll try to move into the Eagle of the Ninth, okay? Um, think about that. Characters that are of two minds or characters that are struggling inside, but no one else can see on the outside. And we'll talk a little bit more about this idea of conflict in the book next week, okay? Since we're running out of time and I don't want to keep you. All right, so finish Dorothy Mills. I'll have your papers next week for you. And maybe, I don't know, I should bring something fun to do since it's the last time. Mad libs are always popular, aren't they? You are very welcome. Have a good 